Welcome to another episode of Heated Conversations. Super excited that you decided to tune into another episode. I love having colleges on the podcast for them to kind of share about who they are as people, the head coaches, as well as talk about their university, the places that they're calling home, that they are able to lead these young athletes, these young women to be able to do great things. And today we have another one. We go all the way to Pennsylvania with Penn State head coach, Sarah Shire. Super excited for her to be on the podcast. Now that you've tuned in, don't forget to hit that notification button and subscribe, share, leave a comment and a like. Let's tune into this episode. Hey, hey Sarah, how are you doing? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing wonderful, doing wonderful. How's the weather? How's things going in um, in Penn State? Things are good. Um, it's not as cold as it should be, knock on wood. Uh, very mild winter, um, but it's really good. Our athletes are training really hard, and we're also looking forward to the holidays. So um, it's it's a really good time to be a Penn Stater. Yeah. Now, do you guys, as a gymnastics program, do you guys call yourselves like Nittany Lions as well? Because I'm a I'm a I'm a, I was a wrestler in high school, and so I've been following Penn State wrestling for a very long time. And so I'm a, for wrestling, Penn State is my, my team in which. They're only like a little bit good, right? Yeah, just a little yeah. bit. They want the absolute a, best. Yes. Yeah. And so, you know, we always like the teams that are doing well when we start to really engage with certain sports. And that was the team that was doing well when I started engaging. But for yeah. gymnastics, kind of, do you guys still use that? You know, the Nittany Lions or what do you guys yeah. call yourself for gymnastics? You know, we do call ourselves the Nittany Lions. And when I first got here, I remember asking the team, like, what do we say? Uh, we obviously have the we are chant, which everybody knows. So we are Penn State three times. And you've got to end that with a thank you. I know you're welcome because we're very polite up here yeah. in the Northeast. Yeah. Um, you also um, we also yell, let's go state all the time. So power of the block S and let's go state. Um, and then, yeah, we we call ourselves the Nittany Lions. Very proud to be Nittany Lions. Um, it is a mythical creature. So um, oftentimes your phone tries to autocorrect Nittany, uh, but it's a thing. And we're very proud of it here at Penn State. I love it. Yeah. No, that's cool. You know, I think um, kind of getting that because sometimes some some programs kind of change up their their motto or even their war cry a little bit, depending yeah. on if it's certain sports or if it's male or female, depending, yeah. you know, um, it's cool when it just across the board, it's the same, right? I mean, we could be the flipping lions, right? But like, it gets like a weird feel to it. Yeah. So we try to use Nittany and lions as often as we can and stick with what everybody knows. We are goes a long way. And every time I'm in an airport, somebody yells it at me. So it's a huge network of people. Yeah. And we'll dive into um, the community in a little bit, yeah. but I want to ask you a couple of questions to kind of get the viewers to get to know you on a different level, right? Okay. So the first question, if you could have anyone cook you a meal, who would you have cook you that meal? And what would you have them make you? It's a really good question. And I wish I had a professional chef in mind because I watched so many cooking shows or I traveled so many places, but my mom is the best cook I know. And so Robin Shire, shout out to you. Um, I'd have her cook me anything she's in the mood for. Um, this Christmas, she's going to make uh, pasta con broccoli, which is one of my homemade favorites. Um, and then that'll be on Christmas Eve. And I'm really looking forward to that. And she's amazing with breakfast and biscuits and gravy and casseroles. So all the things that are probably not to be enjoyed every single day. Uh, but for the holidays, it's that's where it's at. You and your family, did you have a lot of meals together? Because I know as a gymnast, and we'll talk about that as well. Our, your schedule can kind of be busy depending on yeah. when you're practicing or, you know, what type of uh, journey you're going on. Did you and your family prioritize having those, you know, table family dinner times? Yeah, hundred percent. My mom's, she's the best. Um, and I'm an only child, so I'm really lucky. It's just me and my parents. Um, so we were really able to bend our schedule around what was normal for me. Um, and we got home from practice every night between 8.15 and 8.30. And my mom waited and had dinner with my dad and I every night. Um, she also was up every morning. My dad and I left the house at 6.15 every morning to get to school on time. Um, and she had breakfast waiting every single morning at the breakfast table. So I have no idea what she did after we left the house. Because like at 6.15, like, where do you go? But her, her family was out of the house 
house and she was awake. So she got some alone time maybe. Um, but yeah, she's always prioritized mealtimes and we try to do that with our kids as well, but you got to figure out what your family normal is, right? Cause it's different for everyone. And I think that's okay. As long as you guys are together and you make it work. Yeah, absolutely. And those times where you get to spend with your family, those are really instrumental and not to get caught up in just doing, doing, doing and being busy yeah. working or doing gymnastics practice and spending time to really get to know each other on a personal level. Yeah. You know, and as gymnastics coaches, we spend a lot of time with our athletes where sometimes we don't know their story. They may not always get to spend time as much time with their parents, but you know, having those cornerstones of people in your life really help launch you into certain areas and kind of really not only uh, physically design, you know, who you become, because obviously we get traits from our parents that we can physically see, but also the other things that we kind of adopt, you know, through habits that they may have or personalities that they may have. And having those meals are a great time to kind of figure it out. Sometimes, you know, we find ourselves being funny because my dad or my mom crack jokes all the time on the, you know, during dinners or at, at, at the family reunion or whatever it was, right. you know, and I think having a good meal with people that you really care about is a great thing. I agree. I agree. And my second question, if you could see anyone live in concert, dead or alive, who would you go see and who would you take with you? Great question. Um, I would really want to go see Bruno Mars because I've heard great things uh, about the way he puts on a concert. Uh, but also I love his music. It's good energy, positive vibes. The main reason is because my oldest son figured out he's six. Uh, he figured out a few years ago that he had curly hair and not everybody in his class had curly hair. And so we started pointing out famous people that had curly hair. So Bruno Mars is his favorite. And he will yell at the TV and say, like, he's got curly hair like me. So now Bruno Mars does his hair like my son. Um, but it's just, <laughs> been, uh, it's just been something we've talked about for a long time. And I'd love to take him to see it. I think it would be great. Yeah. No, that's so cool. Um, especially when they have those ties, right? And, and that's cool how you said he didn't see people like him. And yet mm -hmm. he made it to where he could find someone he could relate to. Right. And I'm with you on the Bruno Mars. I think I would probably go to that concert with you and your son because, Done. you know, musically, <laughs> Make I it think, happen. right. I love that he encompasses so much. He's not just a singer, you know, yeah. he's a dancer, he's a performer, he's a musician. And those are things for me personally that I love doing, you know, growing up, I played music, as you see, I have a guitar behind me. Yep. Um, I danced, not formally, but um, kind of pat on my shoulder. I was a three-time middle school uh, talent show champion. Good work. Yep. <laughs> and backflips off stages and stuff like that. But um, those are things that I really love. And I love watching great performances. And he's one that I really enjoy watching. Absolutely. Yeah, that that's on the bucket list. Now, is your son practicing those dance moves? All the singing? time. I'm not musically inclined in any way, shape, or form, but there is music on in our house all the time. And we have two boys. They are six and three, um, and they are always dancing. And they are learning moves that I did not teach them. Uh, <laughs> but they love music. And they know their dad has better taste in music than I do. So they ask me all the time for the, the songs that they like. And I have to say, like, those are in your dad's car. Like, I can't, I can't. Do you. So they have to uh, teach me how to be way cooler when it comes to music. Yeah. And I found once I kind of left high school and I went back to like coach high school sports and even I was helping out, you know, doing some stuff in school that once you leave that high school world, you, the trends and, you know, luckily social media helps you kind of stay on track, but you lose out on the trends so <laughs> I don't fast. know what's cool at all. Absolutely. Well, and I'm lucky enough. I get to work with young people all the time. So I'm always getting college age kids around me. Um, so I can like, I see what's cool and I don't think it makes me cool. Um, but it, it definitely keeps you young. Um, and you watch these trends of, you know, newcomers coming in and 
watch the maturity as they get older and move out. But I do feel very lucky to be on a college campus surrounded by young people because um, I think it I think it keeps it fresh. I think it's it's great energy um, and, and I enjoy being a part of a college community. Yeah. And music is something that's so essential in our lives, both as gymnastics coaches. And I think it's something that really moves you and it moves, obviously, your family and your son, you know, to be able to be something different or something more, you know, not necessarily different, but something more and something to relate to. And that's the cool thing about gymnastics floor routines, that yeah. you can really bring a connection to your audience through the way you perform a certain song or certain music. Mm -hmm. And even though there's no lyrics in it, if you have a song that people know the lyrics and you can interpret it through the way you perform, I think it brings a greater connection, right? I agree. Yeah. Now, you know, for some who may or may not know, you were a gymnast yourself, correct? Yes. You're a gymnast at Mizzou. Mm -hmm. Now, can we, we'll go to the point when you got to Mizzou and your experience at Mizzou, but okay. let's go way, way back. We've mentioned a little bit how, you know, after your gymnastics practices, your mom had dinner ready and you would get mm -hmm. home around 8, 8, 8, 15, 8, 30, mm -hmm. right? Can you talk about your journey becoming a gymnast and even that process and people along the way as coaches who are very instrumental to your development? Yeah, I definitely appreciate that conversation because I think we sometimes lose sight of how we got here. And because I keep getting older and my generation I work with doesn't, uh, it's really nice to go back sometimes. So um, I started like a lot of athletes did. I was three years old and there was a bus program that came to my preschool um, and my mom was looking for something for me to do. So I started there um, and at five years old, they told my mom I had talent which is laughable uh, because my mom thought they just wanted her money. Um, and I didn't know that I may be good at it. Right. So I was lucky enough to actually be living in Columbia at the time. And so the University of Missouri was offering a, a Tiger Academy. It was a program um, for young children to do gymnastics. And so I started there um, and honestly just worked my way up until level 10. I was actually um, pretty fast tracked. I was a level 10 at age 10. So I moved pretty quickly up the levels. Um, and then my coach at the time um, actually decided to open a gym in California. And my parents are lovely, but they are not California people. So they were not going to California. Um, but we, I, they gave me the opportunity to try some other gyms. And so we had lined up a series of summer camps um, that we thought might be beneficial in some places that we thought would be a good place for me to continue with gymnastics. Um, and the first camp that I went to was Gage Camp. Um, so I went to Great American Gymnastics Express and it was only two hours from where I was living at the time. So my parents were able to make it work, um, you know, just logistically. And I loved it. I went there for camp um, in the summer and I never left. Uh, my parents went home and packed and I stayed with the host family for a few weeks until we were able to make the official move. Um, and then eventually at the end of the summer, my parents were able to make the move halfway between Kansas City and Columbia which like I said, was about two hours. So we commuted an hour each way. Um, my dad and I towards Kansas City and my mom back towards Columbia, she was able to stay employed there. So um, I was an elite um, for Gage for five years. I was a senior national team member um, and competed internationally for Team USA. Um, and then I graduated and I actually committed to the University of Utah. And I did my freshman year at the University of Utah um, where our team got second at nationals. And after my freshman year, I transferred to the University of Missouri, like you said. Um, I was actually a walk-on there. So I had gone from being a scholarship athlete to a walk-on athlete. Um, and it was really nice to kind of be a local kid. Um, my yeah. parents live 15 minutes from the university. And so I was able to kind of find myself, I think, a little bit um, and try to figure out exactly who I was and what I wanted to do. And um had an okay sophomore year, a very successful junior and senior year. I was lucky enough to be a part of very, very strong teams at Mizzou. Um, and we went to nationals my senior year. And it was kind of a storybook ending. It was it was really, really great. I had a great career and felt really happy to be able to finish my time close to family and friends. Um, and then basically went right into coaching after that. And during this process, you know, going from the your as a young gymnast mm -hmm. all the way until you became a coach when did it when did the spark of become wanting to become a coach and even a collegiate coach 
you know, get, get ignited? For me, it came together my junior year of college, um, especially after you transfer. Sometimes it's hard to find a major that works with your classes. And I really hadn't figured out what I wanted to do. I thought maybe communications. Um, I liked the idea of business, although it was not my strongest suit. Um, and and I wanted to stay involved with the sport. So I'd even considered some sort of like broadcasting or, um, and then at the time there really wasn't a like a job for that. So um, I wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do. And then I fell in love with sports psychology. Um, that was when I actually was introduced to how powerful our mind is. And there were so many things I was learning while I was in a sports psychology class that I just kept thinking, if I would have known this as a gymnast, like I think I would have been a lot better or at least had a very different experience. Um, and so that's when I decided I wanted to coach and, and coaching at the collegiate level seemed right for me just because I had had so many different experiences, right? I had been an elite, I had been highly recruited. Um, I was a part of a really successful program with a scholarship. Then I became a walk-on, then I kind of helped rebuild a program. So I kind of felt like I had seen a number of different sides of collegiate gymnastics and I think because my career ended so strong and, and I was in such a good place that I just felt like it was a great opportunity for me to give back. Um, it was a really great opportunity for me to decide who I wanted to be and how I wanted to coach. Um, and you've kind of alluded to it, but we learn from everybody we work with and you learn what you like and what maybe you would do differently. And so I've certainly been impacted by every single coach I've ever had, um, whether it be something I know I want to stay committed to or whether it be something I really want to stay away from. Um, yeah. And I think all of that is really healthy. And I think that's what shaped me to kind of be the coach that I am now. Yeah. And what would you say is your style of coaching? You know, and sometimes some people may have their own personal style because a lot of styles are really a plethora of the, the people that we look up to and the techniques or, you know, if I wanted to, people say this with other sports like basketball or football or whatever, they would add certain things from other people's game, you know, mm -hmm. Hey, I want to be as tough as, you know, Michael Jordan, or I want to be as clutch as Kobe Bryant. I want to have the right. shooting of Steph Curry, or, you know, I want to have the ten tenacity of LeBron James. And that's what I take. And now that's my style, you mm -hmm. know, for you, what would you say is your style of coaching? I think my style matches with my personality, which is that I'm really high energy. Um, and I'm naturally kind of loud. So I'm loud and energetic. Um, I really appreciate the technique that goes into every um, event that we do and the skills that we learn. And I think that I learned a lot when I was at Gage about technique and form and polish um, and perfection. And I think that is seen in my style as a coach. I want the foundation to be really strong um, so that we can continue to execute the skill well. Um, I care a lot about polish and style and form. I think I pay a lot of attention to leaps and jumps and, and feet and knees and basics. Um, but I think my 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 energy comes through my coaching. I think that the word I would use to describe myself is passionate. I love gymnastics and I love coaching gymnastics. Um, but I think more than that, I love the people that I work with. And this is really my opportunity to be a part of their journey. And I've said that for a really long time that, you know, I get to be a part of these amazingly high level athletes journey, but the reality is they are my journey. Like without them, I don't get to accomplish my own coaching goals. Um, so that relationship and that investment for me is, is crucial um, because I can't accomplish my goals without these athletes. And I can't get to where I want to be as a mom and a head coach and a leader at a power five institution without these athletes as my avenue. So it's really important that I, um, that I protect them, that I protect that um, and that we continue to work together because it truly is a partnership. I think when we're at this level. Yeah. And, you know, also kind of talking about it, you know, when you came in, you came in at a time where the team probably was ready for something different. Mm -hmm. How was navigating coming in with that team and building it to where you have it now? It's a good question. Um, and I often reflect upon it because it's been a, it's been a hard journey. It, it's been a lot, but it's been so rewarding. I think the number one thing I did, even when I was interviewing at Penn State, was I really tried hard to stay true to who I was. Um, I've sat in interviews before where I've tried to talk slower or I've tried to be calmer. And, and to be honest, it's just not who I am. Um, and so it makes me feel uncomfortable and that I don't always answer the way I want to. And 
I was in a really good spot when I was at Eastern Michigan. I loved being the head coach at Eastern Michigan and I was in a great position. And so for me, interviewing at Penn State was really icing on the cake. And I thought if I could stay true to who I am and I can show them who I am, if I'm the right fit, then that's great. And if I'm not, then that's very fine too. Because again, we talk a lot, a, a lot about this, especially in the recruiting process that there's a place for everyone and it, it can't be a one-sided fit. You know, it can't be good for one, but not the other. So I wanted to be really authentic in my, in my interview process with Penn State. And um, once I got here and I had been authentic, I think that made the transition a lot smoother. Um, it obviously had its ups and downs, but I had, I inherited an amazing group of athletes and, and I love those girls. And they had been through a lot and I'm really grateful for our time that we had together. Um, I'd like to think that they ended on a high note um, and they graduated and went on to better things. Um, and then right as we got the ball rolling, the pandemic hit. And mm -hmm. so year three, the pandemic kind of shuts us down and year four and year five were really slow, kind of digging out of that complete halt. You know, we had just limited our practice ability and, and our travel ability and injuries hit us and, and all the things, right? Everybody went through all of that. Um, and so 2023 was really a breakout season for us. And, and going into 24, I finally feel like we're positioned to really show everybody how good we are. Um, but it takes a long time. I, I think I was naive in thinking I could turn things around in three years or maybe even five years. And when you talk to veteran coaches and even coaches I know you've had on this podcast, they will tell you it will take seven, eight, nine years to really get things going. And so to be going into year seven right now, I feel really, really blessed and really excited about the future. Yeah. And I, I think that takes a lot of maturity to be able to change your mindset because you get excited, especially when you may have had your own personal successes sure. and could relate that to what you're trying to do. And because you're in control of what success you could have and be like, all right, especially that by the age 10, you're a level 10, you yeah. know, there was a lot of work and a lot of great work that happened to that point. Right. And then to be able to continue on past that because sometimes you get to be a level 10 at level 10 and by the time you get to 15 you're done because it's right. a lot right and so um <clears throat> you know being able to take take the time to process you know all right this is not where things need to be right now and i'm gonna stay on the you know i have a a, a coaching friend named Craig Tatro, he'd always say, stay on the bus, you know, and just to keep going. And however long it takes, it takes, right? Because sometimes mm -hmm. we, you know, we get in our car and we're saying, hey, I'm going to somewhere I've always been, but for some reason there's traffic, mm -hmm. you know, it normally takes 15 minutes, but traffic's going to make it 30 minutes. You know, I just can't get there. And if I understand that, then it's an easier process. It's an easier car ride than me just sitting there being mad about something I can't mm -hmm necessarily do anything about all I got to do is just ride the wave and just enjoy the journey you know and that's, a, that's a really great anal uh, analogy and we what I've been using this year a lot is just keep showing up like keep showing up keep doing the work you know just like keep going you know and so many times we're looking for the quick fix and I think we're looking for an easy answer and I think we're looking for this light bulb, right and I, I joke but like if there was a magic pill everybody would be taking it like there's not I said that this, I told you earlier, you know, this preseason has felt different to me. Um, and I think that's okay. Like it's a little bit scary, but I think that's okay because if we want to do something different in season than we've ever done before, then maybe this is what preseason needs to look like. Um, and, and I know that we've stuck to our core values, right. And we've stuck to who we are as people. Um, and so my staff feels really good about that. And so does my team, but sometimes guys, like you just got to keep going. Like you just got to keep putting one foot in front of the other. You got to keep showing up and, I think celebrate the small victories along the way. And, and then I think good things happen to good people. So hey, it'll, it'll come together. I love that. And you have mentioned how much you, uh, you know, enjoy the staff that you have. Yeah. Can we dive into your staff? Who's, who's on your staff? Who's helping you guide these young ladies? And what are everybody's role, both coaching, yeah. recruiting, and even how you mentioned you're the energy, like you bring yeah. energy to to the practices, what does the other coaches also bring? Yeah, I appreciate that question because I couldn't do this job alone. Um, and as a head coach, a lot of eyes are on me, but I, I have so many great people supporting me that are a part of this. And the longer we work together, the more I can delegate to them. 
Um, and at times we have heightened communication because we have to, but at times we've been together so long, we don't even have to think about that because the other person is doing it and we know that. Um, so with me, I have Ralph Rosso. Um, he is coaching, he's going into his third season and he coaches vault and bars. Um, Ralph is very methodical in the way that he prepares the athletes. And I believe that he's very patient. Um, he's a great technician. Um, he understands gymnastics really well. Um, but he also is very in tune with what's happening with our athletes. So he is somebody that is very regimented in how he builds their routines and, and very patient with athletes coming back from injury or setback for whatever reason. Um, I see him that way. I think the girls see him as the funny one. Uh, he's always got jokes. He's got good one-liners. Um, he has the ability to break the tension uh, when things get too high. Um, and, and he loves to win. He loves to compete. So um, I think that is a really good combination that he's both competitive, but also lighthearted. Um, and I think that it's been a really great addition having him here at Penn State. Um, I also have Rachel Innes, and she's actually going into her fourth season. Um, and I'm so proud of Rachel. I think that she has grown up so much over her time from an athlete to a coach. And I say that with so much respect. Um, Rachel was a professional dancer at Disney after her time as a gymnast at Auburn. And so she brings creativity and facials and energy in the dance. Um, you had mentioned about floor routines and showing personalities and telling a story and yeah. That is Rachel to a T. Um, she is also very organized um, and very methodical in the way that she prepares floor routines all the way down to the way that she cuts the music and gets to know the athlete and builds the dance routine and thinks about their tumbling. And so she is 100% invested in the entire process from start to finish for building floor routines. Um Rachel has the ability to be both direct and also very motherly and warm at the same time. Um, and she's been a really great colleague for me because I think she's an amazing mom. And I think she understands what it's like to be a woman in the sport. Um, and she's hungry. You know, she's always wanting more um, and she's always pushing us further. And so where I lack creativity uh, sometimes or lack patience uh, with some processes, she's taken a lot of that off my plate. And I think she's brought so much to the program for us, um, which has been really great. Um, and then lastly, this year, we were permitted to hire the fourth coach that everyone's talking about. Um, so we have Lindsay Brown joining us. Um, she's a two-time recent grad from the University of Denver. Um, she's also a Haitian athlete uh, vying for a spot in the 2024 Olympics. And so she's still in her competitive journey um, and just dabbling in college coaching. Um, Lindsay is still kind of taking it in here at Penn State from a coaching perspective, um, but she has shown how strong she is on the creative side of things from a social media perspective and a video perspective. And so she is behind most of the videos that you see on Penn State's Instagram. Um, she's extremely good behind the camera. She obviously knows gymnastics extremely well. Um, and so she's able to be a part of our practices and also is sitting in the office and kind of learning what college gymnastics is like, kind of absorbing, I think, kind of how I was saying, maybe picking up the things she really likes and doing away with the things she doesn't and learning about this, but she's so incredibly consistent. And because she competed at such a high level, I know for a fact that our athletes respect her so much. Um, and it's really great for me to pick her brain as a recent grad um, to kind of, you know, what was this like for you? Or how do you remember that? Because as I get further and further from the sport physically, um, it's nice to be reminded the way that people are training now, or it's nice to hear about the other way um, that athletes are doing something. Um, and so Lindsay's able to bring that and round out our staff really well. No, I, th I love that you have a diversity, you have, you know, experience, and you have people who are really disciplined and methodical with what they do, but yet they have personality, right? Because mm -hmm. I think a balance of all that is what makes for a great team, not having too many of the same thing, because then it can't create separation when it yeah. needs to happen. But at the same time, having unity and like-mindedness, right? And wanting to compete, wanting to do right by the athletes, which is super important. And I, I appreciate how you kind of went about describing everybody and what, what they bring. And some of those things are important because in all reality, some people may go to certain places because of a certain coach. It might be because of who was their recruiter. Um, it might be who they feel connected to and having that, you know, not all the time it'll be 
your assistants that someone connects to. They're like, hey, I connect to Sarah as mm -hmm. the head coach. Some may not connect with you. Some may connect more with your assistants. Some right. of the younger ones or the ones who are maybe some of your older ones may connect with uh, Lindsay just because they just went through the same things pretty, you know, pretty recently or mm -hmm. that she's still competing and they're at their you know, at the peak of their, their um, time of, of performing and stuff and stuff like that and having that, that balance. And lastly, how you said, trying to always keep up, right. And, and be with the times, even though life, it's just the natural process of life, we get further and further, further away from our right. younger years, but it could always be brought back to us by the people we surround ourselves with and your staff and the connections that they make and stuff like that and the relationships. Now, do you, as a program with your leaders, do you have set like captains, you have a leadership team? Um, yeah. how, how do you delegate the leadership on the, the student athlete standpoint? Yeah. That's a really good question. We actually don't have captains. Um, we have, this is the most veteran team that I've had in my time here. So we have 11 juniors and seniors this year um, on a team of 18. So that tells you um, that it's it's a group that's been around for a while. As of last year, all of the athletes on our team were recruited by me and my staff. And I think that makes a difference too, because I think they knew what they were coming into. I've mentioned before that I absolutely adore the athletes that I inherited. Um, but it's just different, right? When you recruit athletes and bring them into a program. And so it's been nice to stick around and see that come to fruition. Um, what I have found is that the leaders will emerge. Um, and I think because you name someone captain doesn't always mean that they act as a captain or that they are going to be a leader. Um, I have found, at least in my experience, it works for some people. But for me, I've just found that it, it creates maybe some unrealistic expectation, right? So like, oh, I'm a captain. So I'm supposed to act like a captain, but like you were chosen because you were acting the way you were acting. And so now you're acting different and, and that feels weird or, or, well, I'm not a captain, so I'm not going to say anything because I don't lead. And and I, I think that that then kind of maybe silences some people who could have stepped up and said something, but didn't feel like they could in that space. And so I think leadership reveals itself. Um, I think that we have some athletes that are better at some things than others. I go to some athletes for questions about apparel. I go to some athletes about questions for timing, right? I, I know my, my athletes really well, and I know my family and my team really well. So I think what I try to do is pull out the strengths in each person and try to give responsibility to each of those areas um, and know what each athlete is capable of. Having said that, it, I think the most successful teams are probably driven from within. So there's got to be leadership within the team, right? There's, there's got to be commonality and a goal that everyone's working hard towards. Um, and so we facilitate a lot of those conversations. Um, we use the DISC profile through athlete assessment and we work with um, Bo Hansen and Liz Mason. And um, we're really connected with that organization and making sure that we've done this DISC development with each of our athletes. And so each athlete has a copy of their own profile and we are able to see how they um, operate in regular life and how they operate in the gym. And that helps us as coaches to tailor our communication and our communication style to what that athlete responds best to. Um, but we also teach them about each other. Um, and so, you know, when your roommate is like this, that's who she is, right? Or when your roommate is stressed, you should approach her like this. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's just something we don't do enough of nowadays, right? Like we get to know each other on social media and, and we watch um, maybe one side of things, but we don't spend time with people. Um, and so we're coming up on my favorite time of the year, which is the travel season. I feel like I know my team, um, but I don't know the freshmen the way that I will after this first travel season. You know, the first time you share a bus ride with them or the first time you sit across from them at a meal that's not a recruiting conversation. Um the first time you ask their opinion on something silly, you know, like restaurant preference or whatever it might be. And you just start to hear their story a little bit differently when the pressure is kind of removed. Um, and again, I think that's that's my leadership style is to sit with you um, and come from that space of curiosity over judgment and try to understand you a little better. And if I can get to know you better and then I can figure out how what you're really great at helps the team, then hopefully I can pull that out of you. And then we're getting all these amazing qualities from 20 different people and everybody's working at their best to help the team. 
Um, and, and I think that's how you create trust too, right? And then and then the leaders really emerge when they trust you. Um, and if you're a leader and your people that are following you trust you, you've hit the sweet spot, right? Like that that's what we're all working towards. So um, that I, I operate a lot from feeling. Um, and my staff knows this, like I speak from a place of feeling, um, what it feels like is, you know, or like, I feel that we might need. Yeah. And I, and I coach like that. Um, I'll say when a kid does a tumbling pass, I'll say, you know, it feels like it's a little like stomping. Right. And they're like, yeah, I'm on my heels a lot. And I'm like, okay. So like, how do we get to our toes? And, and it's not really a technique thing. It's just because I've done the sport for so long and I've seen it and felt it, um, we had an inner squad recently and I said, I feel like everyone feels really light and bouncy. And they're like, yeah, that's great for floor, but it's not great for beam. So like, how do we bring that back down? Right. Mm -hmm. um, and the only way you do that, I think, is with experience and being open and just saying like, maybe I'm wrong, but and then usually you're not wrong. But if you start with that, then you've at least given them the opportunity to say, no, 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 that's not it. Um, and then tell you what's really going on, which is ultimately the goal is to find out what's going on. Absolutely. Making a place for a clear communication and open communication is super important. Yeah. And what are some of the values that you inst are, have instilled in some of those pillars that you have in non-negotiables, both inside the program with the athletes that are currently there yeah. for this 2024 season, but also when you're recruiting student athletes of recruitable ages, what are you looking for? And we had mentioned early already, the everybody at the level that you're that Penn state is at. And, you know, they have the, a lot of times they have the skills, they have this. So what are those things that you're really recruiting? Yeah. That's yeah. That it changes. I think with time, um, but our team's four pillars this year are commitment, trust, passion, and grit. Um, and I think that's what Penn state gymnastics is all about is being fully committed to the program, um, trusting the process being passionate about what it is we do, who we are, who we represent, um, and then a little bit of grit, right? Because it's gymnastics and it's really hard. Um, and being a college division one athlete is really hard. So you need a little bit of that grit as well. Um, my non-negotiables though, are honesty, integrity, communication, and hard work. I don't even put those things in our team standards because that is an expectation. It is expected that you will be honest. It is expected that you will work hard. Um, the communication piece is hard because people communicate differently. And so what I think is good, effective communication may not be what you think is. So that's a piece we have to work on. Um, and we talk a lot about that. We talk about what's appropriate for email, what's appropriate for text, what's a face-to-face -face conversation, um, how to have a two-sided conversation. Um, I think mm. sometimes with communication, we build up this big speech and then we present it. And we forget that the other side has the right to respond, right? Mm. So like it's a two-way communication. Um, and I think if we can, you know, if we can focus on the commitment, trust, passion, grit, we can fold into those things, then we're going to be even better. But if we're worried about being honest or having integrity or working hard, um, then we're then we're wasting our time. Like mm. I, Those are things that I don't have time for. Your division one power five athletes. You come from great homes, great coaches, wonderful people that have supported you um, and taught you. And, and if you haven't learned yet, then I'd like to think that my staff and my team are going to show you that as soon as you step on campus, these are the non-negotiables. Um, and hopefully I'm a good enough example for you to realize that um, I'm very honest and, and I, I have a very high level of integrity, but I do work really hard. And if I'm wrong, I'll tell you I'm wrong. And then we'll learn and we'll move forward. I think it's okay to make mistakes too. And in parenting and in coaching, you can, you can mess up, you're allowed a mistake, just be mm -hmm. honest about it and don't do it again, you know, move on the next time. So, um, so I think our standards are a little different than my non-negotiables. I think the standards we're always striving for, and those are big ones. I mean, commitment, trust, passion, and grit. Those are, those are big ones. And I think um, we're on the right track, but those are the ones that it's like, when you start to veer away, you gotta, like, you gotta like, come on, like we said, we were going to be committed. Like it's a tough day, but we got to keep going. I shouldn't have to be coaching your work ethic or your honesty, right? Like that, that's a, that's a non-negotiable. Yeah. And with transfer portal being now a hot thing, right? Not only in gymnastics, but in other sports is probably a hotter thing in other sports. Yeah. You know, you had mentioned earlier, this is the first complete team that you have recruited. Mm -hmm. Um, do you guys entertain transfers or even how do you guys deal with transfers coming in? But even if people want to transfer out, 
you yeah. know, because they may have felt like this is not the place for them. And it may not be anything like specifically about the team. It just might be, I'm, I realize I really want to be home or, sure. you know, whatever the case may be. How do you guys navigate through that? And are you still looking for those same characteristics and pillars that you had mentioned in those athletes? Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely a hot topic. Um, I do think you're right. I think gymnastics is maybe not as um, active in the portal as other sports, but it happens. Um, we obviously are keeping our eye on the portal all the time. There are a couple of exemptions for why an athlete can join the portal outside of the window uh, following season. And so we've kept our eye on that. Um, I think it's a little bit about the athletes in the portal, but it's a lot about what your team needs um, and, and where are our needs. So at the end of the year, when we look at who we're going to graduate or what events we're missing, we could go into the portal kind of with that idea. Um, I absolutely am looking for the same things. There are some pretty tough NCAA rules surrounding parameters of you taking a transfer. Um, and you really have to make sure it's a good fit. I think you really have to make sure that this athlete wants to be here for all the right reasons. Um, because from a scholarship perspective, oftentimes they're entitled to their scholarship regardless of the output. And so I think we have to be really careful with that. We have two transfers right now on our team and they're lovely. Uh, we we absolutely enjoy them and they're, they're fitting in so great. Um, I was a transfer, so I have a little bit of soft spot, I think for transfers, but to your point, um, if there were athletes that wanted to transfer out of our program, again, I would just ask the same thing that there just be this honest communication about what your goals are and why, and how I could support you. Because at the end of the day, I have now recruited all these athletes, which I sometimes remind them, like, remember that I picked you, like, I, I want you, I, mm -hmm. I went to your house or your gym, called you on the phone and I picked you. Um, and there was a lot of athletes out there to choose from. So I would love to think that we have a strong enough relationship that if it doesn't feel like the right fit now, that we're going to have an honest conversation about why and how I can help you moving forward. And, and I mentioned, you know, there's a place for everybody and gymnastics should be for everyone. It should be a very inclusive space for everyone. And so if I can help you in the transfer portal to find a home that feels like a better fit for whatever reason, then I certainly want to be a part of that. I think sometimes, you know, the gym internet maybe gets caught up on the competitiveness of it all. And, and don't get me wrong. It is, it, it's a hundred percent, you know, everybody's going after the best athletes, but at the end of the day, we're dealing with people mm. and, and kids. It's somebody's daughter who's unhappy and wants to be happier. And if you can be a part of that in a positive way, go you, you know, right. why, why wouldn't you be? Right. And also, I think with the fifth year, uh, because of COVID and stuff like that, there's people who are trying mm -hmm. to find a home to be able to complete their entire gymnastics um, career, right? Because sometimes what happens is there's, you know, many cases where I was, um, you know, I did my four years, say I did my four years at, you know, the University of Texas, which doesn't have gymnastics, but for example, and then, you know, I, I still had another year of eligibility. There's that reason why people transfer as well, you know, and being able to navigate that, you know, and, and, you know, because again, not every program has those spots. They're only allotted certain amount of spots and if they've already used them right. in their recruiting you know um for different classes then again and again it, if for you personally because finances is also a, a key and we'll talk about that in a little bit and you need you know what you had if you had a scholarship you know for four years then you know diving into those things you know and is that is that a process if you had an athlete who was in that situation help out with and how would you kind of go about that? It's, it's just certainly tricky, right? Like it's a business and also it, you're dealing with people. And so it's a really hard position to be in. I was with the Big Ten commissioner not long ago and, and he said that coaches are in a tough spot because right now we're being asked to be both general manager and head coach. And sometimes the decisions that I make if I were playing general manager would be very different than the decisions I would make if I were playing head coach. And sometimes they don't always match up. So I think that's really hard. Again, I think we have to, one, you have to look at the the logistics of it all. Like you said, is there a scholarship available? Is there a space available? But um, if an athlete wants to be a part of your program, then I'd like to think that there are ways that you can help them stay there, right? Whether that be a scholarship, whether that be an NIL opportunity, whether that be a part-time job, 
um, whether that be a reduced course load, you know, maybe just the minimum so it doesn't cost so much. Or we've had athletes that have applied for in-state tuition before um, just to, you know, cut down on those costs. And so I think you have to be creative in all of those spaces. And, and every situation is so different that I can't sit here and say that there's one way to do it. Um, but coming out of COVID, things were just different. Um, and we're going into kind of that last year of next year will be the last year that athletes were given that COVID year. And so I don't, I can't predict what's going to happen in the portal, but I would say that there might be a little less activity in the portal from a gymnastics perspective, perhaps, um, just because you're not going to have as many of those fifth year opportunities. Um, but maybe not, I don't know, maybe I'll be wrong. And in a year from now, I'll say there's 10 times as many athletes in the portal for whatever reason. Um, I think we just have to be focused on what's best for the athlete, what, and you have to be mindful of what's best for the program. Um, as difficult as that is, um, sometimes you have to separate that and those things don't always match up. Um, so far I, I've been, I feel very, very thankful and grateful for the athletes we've gotten from the portal and, and very happy with the team that we have here. Um, and so it's not something that's come up yet. Um, I know it will at some point in my time, and I think we'll just handle it when it comes and, and look at it case by case and decide what's best for each athlete. And you had mentioned a little bit about NIL, and I want to dive into that, you know, because I think that's obviously a pretty new sphere. And mm -hmm. in gymnastics, you know, there's one prominent, you know, athlete that really is known at LSU, right? And just in general, how in how does it work in gymnastics? Is that something that you're seeing that athletes are coming in now when they're doing the recruiting process and having those conversations saying, hey, what does it look mm -hmm. like for me to have opportunities? Or is that something that you guys encourage them to do part of when they're there? Say, hey, look into these opportunities to do this and that. And is it something, you know, for just scholarship athletes or also for non-scholarship athletes? Yeah, really good questions. And, and again, kind of case by case, but um, we're getting a mixed bag right now of prospects that are very educated in the NIL space and are coming prepared, um, either having already started their own business and looking to continue that or looking and being interested in a partnership with an opportunity with a with a company, right, for an opportunity in NIL. And then we get athletes that really aren't sure, you know, much about that. And so then we provide them with the educational resources and opportunities that are available to them. Um, I think every institution is different all the state laws are different. So you'll see some things happening at some programs that are just legally not going to happen at other programs. Um, legislatures have to make changes. Um, and it been We have an NIL collective that is so supportive of our student athletes um, and our athletes have access all the time, 24 seven um, to the people that are in town that are able to help them get those NIL deals. Um, they're available to everyone. And I think what we've seen a lot of is you see NIL deals for your most famous athlete, right? For your highest scoring athlete, they might get a deal. But really, I think what our collective is doing and what our administration is helping with is making sure that our athletes that aren't on scholarship are living a life that will allow them to be comfortable so that they can focus on their sport. And so NIL opportunities are a great way to support our walk-on athletes or to support the athletes that are not on full scholarship. Um, again, it's case by case, but I will say um, gymnastics is doing incredibly well in the NIL space. And I think it's amazing what our gymnasts are earning and what opportunities they have. I'm such a big fan um, of I wish there was a little more guidance with what we were doing, but I'm a fan of this model in general. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I think our athletes deserve all of this. And I think they deserve all the praise they're getting, especially female athletes, um, that they are truly raising the bar. And and what I've seen in gymnastics and, and with women, especially, is you see these women who are getting these NIL deals. And the first thing they're doing is giving back to other women who need those deals as well. And so this like spirited group of, you know, entrepreneurs and, and young people, I think are really raising the bar for competitiveness, but they're also showing their, their spirit and their culture and, and this philanthropic feel to give back um, to either women who need help getting those deals or to their institutions or to causes that really mean a lot to them. Um, and just the awareness piece has been great. So um, I know it's not a perfect model. And I know that it's challenging to navigate at times, but I would say in general, we're moving in the right direction. And, and to be a gymnast right now means you have a lot of opportunity, both from a scholarship and competitive perspective, but also in the NIL space. Yeah. And I think 
with gymnastics not really having a route that is as clear to become a professional, yeah. having a way to be able to make, you know, uh, uh, income is is great, you know, yeah. um, and learning the on- entrepreneurship. But I think some of the difficult things and now this is me just assuming. And so I'm just going to ask the question, but when you have an athlete who, you know, may be doing well with that or have athletes coming in that might really know what they want, Mm -hmm. does it become a distraction ever where it's like, you know, it becomes about that. And if social media blows up and they're famous on social media and stuff like that, does that become a distraction or does it become almost free marketing and allows people to know more about, you know, the Penn State Nittany Lions and understand, hey, you know, because this person that I'm following who's partnered with this company and this and that or these products that I really enjoy, now I'm a fan of the sport. Kind of what has been your experience or just from what you've seen with NIL? Yeah, no, it's a good question. And I can only speak from my perspective here at Penn State, but all of our, no, many of our athletes have NIL opportunities. And um, it's never been a distraction for us. I, I've watched them be in each other's corners and celebrate each other and say, wow, that's really cool. How'd you get that? Or can you help me get that? Or I'd like to do that, but do it this way. And so it's facilitated great conversation and huge support. And again, I think it depends on what your leadership stands for. Um, and I, I won't stand for that being a distraction, right? We're not going to come at each other, right? And you, you see these, these quotes about you know, great women fixing each other's crowns, right? We're not competing in that space. Like let's compete as Penn State. That's where we should go blow for blow, right? Like as Penn State athletes against other teams. Um, but coming at each other, that's not that's not what we're doing. And and at the end of the day, you know, at the foundation of what we do, they came to Penn State to do gymnastics. They chose this team to be a part of the gymnastics team. So my hope is that they will stay focused on the gymnastics piece and still earn through these other opportunities and avenues, but remember their foundation and their core and who they are um, and then represent Penn State really well, because that's ultimately why they're here and and what they're shooting for right now. Right. And I know you guys compete in a like, like a legendary uh, um, competition arena, right? Yes. Can you kind of talk about the environment there and what it brings, you know, competing yeah. um, at Penn State? Yeah, so we compete at Historic Rec Hall um, and it's right here on campus um, and it's it still has the same brick foundation that it had 100 years ago. Um, But the inside is extremely state of the art, brand new lighting, brand new floors, updated video boards, concessions, state of the art locker rooms. Um, You're really transformed when you walk in Um, and everyone says like, wow, I didn't expect that. You know, they see this old brick building and then they come in and it's great for television. Um, We have the studio right inside the gym so we can produce large caliber meets. We can fit the podium inside. So we've hosted Big Ten championships and regional championships consistently since I've been here. Um, Our fan base is so strong. We market mostly to to families, but we're increasing our student draw as well. Here at Penn State, we have 31 varsity sports. So on any given night, you know, there's men's volleyball, there's wrestling, there's hockey, there's gymnastics, there's basketball all across campus at the same time. And so we're obviously working really hard in the marketing department to bring people in. Um, But what I know to be true is that parents and children love gymnastics and we provide a really high energy, safe and warm environment. Uh, When you compete in the winter, it is really nice to have something to do on Friday night that's not freezing. Um, And so it's such an electric environment and there's so much history in the building. Um, This year, they're even bringing our basketball team to, they've been playing in a bigger arena and they're actually coming back to Rec Hall for a week. Um, And so there's just a sense of you know, Penn State Foundation um, and history and that building. And and we've been called upon to host many times um, at all these major championships and our staff does an amazing job. Um, and so I'm very, very proud when we walk into Rec Hall. Um, I'm very proud to be a Penn Stater and to have my team competing in such a great environment. Yeah. And that's a lot of it is cool, you know, and in a sport that's about performance. Well, sports, a lot of it is about performance for those, the fans, you know, and ourselves and our, our coaches, but having an environment that really can produce that is great. Now, academically, yeah. what are 
your standards, but also what does Penn State offer in regards to what are the popular uh, degrees that people come to yeah. Penn State to pursue? So Penn State's an extremely competitive academic school. Uh, it's rigorous. Uh, we're a very large campus with very large um, colleges. We offer over 275 different majors. Um, we're known for engineering. Um, we have a really strong business school. Um, but to be honest with you, we have athletes that go on to be doctors and lawyers, um, financial planners and, and careers in marketing. We've never really said no to any of those majors, um, but it is a tough academic school and our kids work really hard. Um, I think my standard is your, your best effort always, right? First and foremost, you got to go to class and you got to give your best effort. Most of the time, I think that we should be able to accomplish a 3.2 to a 3.3, right? A's and B's. I'm very happy there. My team, blows it out of the water. Um, three, six, three, six, five, three, six, seven. Um, they get better every single year. And I'm obviously super proud. Um, we're in the top three of all GPAs on campus amongst all the teams at Penn State. And I'm, I'm so proud of them. I'm, that's not the goal, right? Like it's awesome. Um, and I'm happy for them. I think they're just, they're great students and, and they're disciplined individuals and they've made it part of our culture to be great in school. And so they help each other and they are offered tutors and mentors and they, you know, make sure that if they're going to take a class, maybe their teammate could take it at the same time and they study together. Right. So um, they're just, they're really smart kids and, and they work really hard. And so academics, something we've become known for um, really, I just, I want them to work hard and, and do the best they can. And they just keep getting better and better every year. That's right on. Cause uh, you know, they're student athletes, right. And going yeah. there to be able to be great at both. And that's cool that they take the initiative within themselves to do so. Yeah. Now, for someone who may not know exactly where Penn State is, where are you guys located? Yes. And what, talk about the community that um, resides, where Penn State resides and how the community supports the the, the university and how the university supports the community. Yeah. So we're in State College, Pennsylvania, which is basically right in the middle of the state of Pennsylvania. We're about two and a half hours from Pittsburgh and three and a half hours from Philadelphia. Um, so if you're looking for city life, we have that on the weekend. Um, but State College is a small town. To be honest with you, it's a farm town. Um, there are cows and horses around our campus, which a lot of recruits are surprised by um, when they fly in. We do have an airport here. So you fly right into State College and um you see this small town and then you drive three miles from the airport and you show up on campus and it is, it's unbelievable, right? It's 45,000 students, state-of-the-art laboratories, top research institution. Um, we have hundreds of thousands of dollars in endowed scholarships and so much support for our athletic department. Uh, we have the second largest football stadium in the country. So we seat over 107,000 people week in and week out at Beaver Stadium. Um, and everything we do revolves around Penn State. So um, this community shows up for us. I think we are this community. I think athletics is ingrained in, in what Penn State is and Penn State's ingrained in State College. Um, but the campus actually has its own zip code. And so if you're on campus, you're in University Park. Um, but if you're in town, you're in State College. So it gets a little bit tricky sometimes, um, but that that's how it is here. And everybody knows that the University Park zip code is different than the State College zip code uh, because you have your town and then you have your college and we make up most of the town. So if Penn State University wasn't there, then it wouldn't. There would be no University Park for sure. Yeah, that's cool. That's really yeah, cool. It's great. Now, now, tuition you know, is it, well, obviously being Penn State, it's a public school. So what yes. is the tuition um, for the university? And do they do many um, scholarships academically, but yeah. also for in-state, out-of-state? How does that work for student athletes who may be walk-ons? Yeah, it's a really good question. And unfortunately, it's a really hard one for us. Um, because Penn State is a research institution, um, even the top academic students that come here that want to walk on to our gymnastics team don't often qualify for a lot of academic funding. Um, it's something that we're working on with our athletic department. But to be honest with you, a lot of that academic money goes towards researchers who are 
working in much higher fields than what our undergraduate students might be working in. Um, the out-of-state tuition is, is pretty steep and it can get quite expensive, which I think is why NIL has been so beneficial to us. Um, also, there's a local club gym in town where our athletes have worked before. We offer summer camps where they've been able to work for us before. Um, and we do the best we can to try to build a package that seems reasonable. Um, obviously, getting an extra roommate, you know, it cuts down on your rent. Um, and there's just a number of things that you can do, kind of tips and tricks for for going into college. But to be honest with you, the, tr the tuition is high. Uh, and everybody, I think, knows that going in. But it is the top academic degree that you can get, right? If you graduate with a degree from Penn State, um, not only are you joining the largest alumni network in the world, um, but you're going to be connected with hundreds of thousands of Penn Staters everywhere you go. And I said earlier, people will shout we are at me all the time in the airport. Um, this this alumni network and this base that you're going to be a part of, this family that you get to be a part of when you're here is unlike anything I've ever seen anywhere else. And, and it's honestly not just because I work at Penn State. I think other people would tell you that. Um, but it truly is a special place. And so when you graduate with a degree, you're going to be connected with people that are going to be in your field of interest, want to help you get a job, want to talk about their experience and are going to always feel connected to Penn State. And so when our Penn Staters come back, it's unbelievable the love and the support they have for this program. And we're celebrating 60 years of women's gymnastics here at Penn State. So we've been around a long time. Um, you know, we've got Clemson in their very first year this year. And I've watched a lot of other institutions celebrate 50 years. I know there's some schools that just hit 50. We're at 60. Um, mm -hmm. We've been doing this for a really long time. And, and we're really proud of what we've accomplished and who we are. Um, and our alumni show up for us. Like it, it is truly a family when you graduate from here. That is so cool to have such a legacy to be able to, you know, and it could feel like pressure, but it could just be such an honor to be chosen. Yeah. It and feels so be, good. Yeah. Right. Right. And have such support, right. Um, ha as you mentioned, just with the football stadium being as, as large as it is having 45, you know, uh, students on campus, you know, being able to have a lot of that support and across the country, across the world, have a lot of people, um, uh, I think is great. Do you have any like last minute things that you want to kind of, you know, nuggets or anything like that, or, you know, anything that, you know, you'd want the listeners and viewers and potential, you know, future student athletes, coaches, and parents to, yeah. to know about you and, or, um, the Penn state Nittany lions. No, I, I do appreciate that opportunity. Um, we got an athletic director last year, Dr. Pat Kraft, um, and he's now in his second season here and a second season. He's in his second year. He's not a coach. <laughs> he's in his second year and he's, he's tremendous. He's everything that he said he was going to be and more. So we are building um, a huge new student athlete complex that is going to encompass all of their meals. It's a wellness center. It's an athletic training space. Um, it's a community space, a, a group, a way for all of our student athletes to connect we have 850 student athletes. I said, we mentioned, as I mentioned, 31 varsity sports. Every single one of our facilities is top notch. And if it's not, we're building it. Um, so we've recently renovated our field hockey stadium. There's more renovations happening in our football complex. Um, our weight room is undergoing renovation. I mentioned to you, my office is under renovation. Um, there's new equipment going into our gym. Our fueling station was just updated. I mean, I could go on and on and on about all the things that we have to offer here, but the coolest part about it, and, and actually what I shared with Pat recently, was that when our 2024s were on their official visits last year, we were sharing all of this. We had just met Pat within three or four months, and we were just learning about all the things he wanted to do with Penn State. And they took their official visits, ultimately ended up verbally committing, and came back just before signing day this fall. They came for an unofficial visit just to be together. And the coolest thing was that all the things that we had been talking about were now in place a year later. So when I'm recruiting the 25 class and I'm telling them what's coming next year, I keep letting them know that I'm not just saying it, like it's actually going to happen. And when you get here, it's going to be a part of your experience. And who's to, who, you know, who's to say what's coming in 26, 27, 28. So it's just a really good time to be here. Um, I feel very grateful to kind of be on the ground floor of the work that Pat is doing. I believe wholly in his vision and, and where we are as an athletic department. And so it's a great community. Um, I get to be a part of 24 head coaches um, that collaborate with one another. And you mentioned our wrestling program, which is amazing, but so is football and volleyball. And everybody at Penn State is great. Um, so I'm surrounded by the best of the best in, in all areas. And so when we come together as a coaching staff um, and we talk 
as head coaches about how to recruit better or be better at Penn State, you know, you're not just getting the best in gymnastics, like you're truly getting the best in the world. Um, and I, I think that's, it's a really cool place for me to be and, and for me to learn. And now going into year seven, I'm not just the newbie anymore. So I actually can speak from experience and, and see the changes that we've had, which has been really, really awesome. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you coming on and talking about yeah. Penn State. And I know we didn't mention this, but you guys are part of the Big Ten Conference, which is the biggest gymnastics conference in the country, yes. host, um, hosting the most teams. And mm -hmm. I, you know, it's pretty competitive to compete there. And yeah. so if there's people who are interested in gymnastics, tune in to the Big Ten Network and yes. tune in to um, watch the the Big Ten and and the Nittany Lions compete and to see a lot of the things that they're they're talking about that's that Sarah was mentioning and talking about super excited for what they have going on again thank you for tuning in to another episode of heated conversations remember to subscribe to share to like and leave a comment if you have any questions or anything like that leave it below we'll share it we'll link their information and um I'll see you guys on the next one thank you